All right, hi everybody. Let's get started, or I'm going to get started, and you're going to keep doing whatever it is you're doing, enjoying your salad or your crawfish, I guess. That's kind of exciting. Uh, I'm still DJ. You remember me from previous new faculty success program <laughs> meetings. I'm going to be joined later in today's presentation by your cohort member, Victoria. So looking forward to that, because today we're talking about AI literacy. You've heard me talk about AI before, and I will use the phrase AI syllabus statement, but it's, I'm not going to really spend any time talking about it, except in relation to this bigger concept of AI literacy. Um, so first, however, SDSU's land acknowledgement. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. So again, I'm DJ, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm really looking forward to talking about this subject today because AI literacy, for me, has emerged as one of the big concepts that all of us as faculty members across disciplines can get behind. You remember when you spent the morning with our colleagues over at ITS, and they've developed a robust response to the emergence of generative AI on campus. They've developed an educational micro-credential that's been launched for faculty and is uh, being rolled out in beta for students. Last year, at about this time, they had the results of a survey of AI use directed at students. They also have uh, faculty and student AI fellows, and they've been really good about partnering across campus, including with the CTL. Last year's AI survey directed at students showed that had about 20% of all SDSU students respond, so nearly 8,000 students. That actually got national attention because it was a really big response rate. And a year ago, more than 50% of students reported that they regularly used AI in their coursework. Those same students reported about a third of faculty encouraged use of AI. I'm not sure of that number, but that was uh, what our colleagues in uh, CTL have shared. And more than 70% of students last year said that they expected that AI was going to impact their professional life after graduation. I, I hope that most of you were aware that SDSU just closed another survey. And this year's survey was directed not only at students, but at faculty and staff. Who participated in the AI survey? Fantastic. I'm very happy to see a bunch of hands go up. Great, great. Uh, I was a co-author of the faculty <laughs> section of the survey. And I'm pleased to share with you just some top line results even more students, that was 7,800 plus students last year. Over 10,000 students responded this year out of the uh, really big uh, population of 39,000 for more than 25% of all our students. 638 faculty members seems like a tepid response, but it is well over 25% of our total faculty, and that includes ladder rank faculty as well as uh, full and part-time lecturers. So a big response, and I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to dig into the data and learn what there is to learn about, particularly faculty engagement with generative AI. I want to say right now, I am not an AI cheerleader. Most of the time when you hear me talk, you hear me talk about generative AI. So I feel the need to mention, I'm not here to encourage everyone to use it. I do feel, though, that learning more about it is useful for all of us. Now, here's this, uh, this is really just an image. I don't expect you to be able to read any of this. The Modern Language Association, in collaboration with the Conference on College Composition and Communication, also known as the Four Cs, these are the people, the, the big professional organization for faculty who teach writing particularly in the United States. These two organizations have collaborated on a number of responses to generative AI, including two interesting white papers. But they've got this student guide to AI literacy. It's two pages. It's dense. I think that it's really a very good TLDR for faculty who are interested in learning more about this concept, AI literacy. 
which they begin by describing as the ethical and effective use of Gen AI technologies. In a nutshell, that's what it is. What are we teaching our students when we teach AI literacy? We're helping them develop literacy, sorry, developing literacy with any tool means becoming a more skilled and thoughtful user of that tool. Usually literacy, to me, means like reading. But reading is a tool. Books were technology 400 years ago and sometimes scary to folks in, say, early modern Europe. Now we're dealing with things that we think of technologies as uh, often digital tools. So, AI literacy. When we're teaching AI literacy, we're teaching students ethical and effective use of generative AI. If we are teaching our students to become skilled and thoughtful users of these AI tools, that includes teaching them when is the right time to use them and when is a time not to use them. What I think is valuable about AI literacy is that it's a new learning outcome that everyone can get behind. A lot of faculty are disinterested in generative AI. And it's really not just faculty. I read a, a newspaper article in the New York Times today um, saying no to our AI overlords. And <laughs> the second paragraph includes the sentence, but a lot of people never asked for these tools and technologies. And the reporter uh, shares some informal documentation of feedback that outside of Silicon Valley, a lot of people remain, and this is outside of academia, uninterested in engaging with new generative AI tools despite the fact that they are being heavily promoted to us. And I see the same thing informally on campus. A lot of faculty who are just not interested. To, we could say in denial, but I think it's fairer to say uh, faculty who simply don't want to uh, change everything about the way they teach in order to engage with these new technologies. I'm interested in the survey that just closed, in part because I'm interested in knowing how much our students are using these tools, because I think that number is going up far faster than the number of faculty using the tools. And my concern is that we as faculty not miss out on the opportunity to teach our students how to use these tools, which will vary by instructor to instructor, and here's where the AI syllabus statement comes in. Sorry, this is the only slide on AI syllabus statements. What does it do? Well, it clarifies students' expectations about your expectations. They know your parameters about Gen AI use in your class. And it will identify per assignment or as an umbrella concept for the whole course what you consider appropriate uses of Gen AI. But in the context of AI literacy, your AI syllabus statement is your first opportunity to teach your students about AI literacy. Now, I hope it's not the last. Early in the class, you should be standing in front of your students, maybe pulling up your AI syllabus statement or talking through its key points one way or another. But there, you should take other opportunities over the course of the semester to talk with students about AI literacy perhaps on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on how you're using or not Gen AI in your course. Because there will be faculty who want to opt out of using and assigning generative AI tools. And that's fine. But generally, I feel that in order to effectively opt out, in order to level set AI use in your class, we now need to, as faculty, upskill to understand more than just the basics of generative AI in order to be able to teach the course we want to teach. Questions about that? Because I've got an example and Victoria is going to talk a little bit too about what it means, what AI literacy means in her fields. So I know you can't read all this, I'm going to talk through it. A colleague in the School of Theater, Television, and Film 
uh, teaching in the film uh, critical studies program, Mara Abdallah. She's also a doc student in Com at UCSD. She and I have been talking uh, from last year into this year. She's one of my colleagues, and she's given me permission to share this assignment. Write a short paper, three to four pages. I've just excerpted a really detailed and robust assignment prompt. In writing your paper, you must showcase your engagement with course materials in the form of direct quotes. So far, so standard. She also adds, this assignment is generative AI level three. She's already got a syllabus statement that outlines, here are different generative AI levels that you will encounter in this course. Halfway through the course, here's one at what she calls level three. You may only use ChatGPT or another gen AI to clean up your existing thoughts or writing. So she's reminding students how she's previously level set in her AI syllabus statement. You may not use it to produce your writing, define your terms, or analyze your experience. Doing so will constitute a violation of academic integrity. If you choose to use ChatGPT or another Gen AI, you must include a 50 to 100 word statement at the end of your work cited about how you used it and what it taught you about your own writing. So she's level setting. I want you to use your own organic little brain to come up with the ideas, especially the parts where you, des you know, describe your personal experience. That seems basic, but I encounter this even in the arts. A colleague of mine has given listening assignments. What did you feel when you heard this song? I'm not going to be checking for grammar or punctuation. Just tell me your feelings. A colleague in dance. What did you feel when you performed this dance? I'm not looking for grammar or punctuation. Just tell me what it felt like. And they both recorded uh, clear evidence of students using generative AI to, to, in the assignments where students were relieved of technical writing criteria and just asked to describe their personal feelings. So, and then also Marwa includes, you know, if you use these tools, great. They might enhance your final outcome at the low cost of 50 to 100 words, that's up to half a page of double-spaced 12-point Times New Roman. Yes, I was just going to say, questions? Uh, how do they know that they might have violated the level three, so meaning use it for creating, producing the writing, not okay. just cleaning it up? I'm not joking. The question is totally reasonable, and I'm almost crying because there is really no way. <laughs> AI detectors don't work. They're unreliable. They're biased against English language learners. Mm -hmm. It's hard. That should not be your default. And I'm going to run these through the Turnitin.com AI detector. It's going to be wrong one way or another 10% of the time by their own numbers, which are probably inflated. So Mar was taking a deep breath here and crossing her fingers firmly to say, look, here's what I want you to do. Because I want you to learn to write, define terms, and analyze your own personal experience yourself before you outsource your thinking to a machine. Most students, and I do feel most of our students are people of uh, good conscience. They're going to say, oh, that's reasonable. And some won't. Now, I'd like to invite Victoria up here to talk about some of the same subjects from her perspective. Wonderful. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, CJ. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> my name is Victoria. She, her. Uh, I'm an educator. I taught in mathematics high school education for seven years before I uh, went to grad school. And um, tools always seem to shape uh, the teaching that I did in different ways and informed student thinking. And so when I got to the work of exploring AI, I thought about like, how is this going to impact teaching and learning and how will it impact teaching and learning in my discipline specifically. And that's why I've made it part of my research program. I have um, a master's degree in AI and that was more because I was curious about these systems, but like, I feel like so often teachers are on the receiving end of like, oh, the technology is going to be invented and then we're going to ask you to do something with it. And I, I wanted to not have that happen to me. I wanted to deeply understand the tool if indeed I was going to be asked to teach with it and 
now in 2024, here we are. Um, for some context, because I think what I'm about to say is only going to make sense if you understand who and what I teach. Um, this semester, I teach 10 graduate math, uh, future math teachers for um, community college or, or high school mathematics. They are wonderful. They also don't really like AI that much. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of them have not used it in depth before my class. And I think that's important because the activities that I'm doing with them um, kind of reflect that stance against AI because a lot of them came into my class with like, this idea about like why would I use this thing if I can think of something um, and, and just do it on my own without the tool. And so the impetus for us this semester is if you're going to be a teacher and your future students will be using these tools, you really need to stress test them because you don't want your students making your AI policy for you and you um, sort of responding in real time. And so um, what we've been doing each class is um, assignments and activities that integrate AI and we do the activity we talk about our thinking and our mathematics learning in teaching and pedagogy but then we also talk about how is the activity mediated and how is our thinking mediated by these AI tools and to me what I want this what this is all building toward is this critical thinking about AI use knowing not just when to use it or not in an ethical sense because I feel like a lot of the AI talk is about like well is this ethical is this cheating what I really want my students to know is does it fulfill an actual need that you have or does it not? And if it doesn't, it's okay to not use AI. Like if you don't need an intelligent tutor, you don't have to go get an intelligent tutor. Or like if I want Brittany to be my tutor and she's okay with that, then and that's what I prefer, like that is okay. So I want students to understand that AI can be helpful, but they also have options. And that I think speaks to this part of uh, what DJ put on the slides earlier, so I wanted to try to connect it to that. Right. So um, what we started out by doing is in the articles that we read, which are about statistics, education, and pedagogy, and thinking and learning, is we had the some sort of AI tool generate a one to two paragraph summary, and then students would critique the summary and then synthesize in their own ideas and challenge the text beyond what the AI was doing. And so, um, this over here was what the AI, someone's AI chatbot output in response to an article. And then one of the students would write in response, like, oh, it does something that the text mentioned, but it fails to mention the relationship that the authors established that ends up being the important part of the piece. So here they're really thinking about how is AI limited and how is my own thinking going to generate a writing product that's better than whatever I'm prompting the chatbots do. And throughout the course of the semester, we started generating a running list of, in relationship to our discipline, what do we notice that AI is good at doing and where is it not helpful for us? Two caveats to that is one that's person dependent because it depends on like what your relationship and knowledge to AI is and your relationship and knowledge to the subject matter. And then also, um, my students are not really linguists or computer scientists, and so um, their prompting skills may have impacted these answers because I've noticed sometimes when I teach them, they don't always develop like the most elaborate prompts, and I feel like that's something they could learn on their own. That's not the sole focus of my class. But in general, we found that it's good at generating um, practice problems, making contrasting cases, um, giving hints sometimes depends on what you prompted and what how detailed you want the hint to be. And then we've uh, determined that AI is not so good at some of these, these other things. And again, I think it's important for students to get in that mindset of like, okay, for me and my discipline, what is it good at and what is it not? And then what this built toward um, was a midterm that I gave them. It's actually out right now. It's due on Sunday with a very, very liberal Gen AI use policy, meaning that I told them you can use AI in a bunch of different ways to help you write your midterm, which is a six to eight page essay on basically the things that we've been talking about to date in my class. Um, for In order for this, I think, to be useful, I wanted to try to show you a little bit of what that looked like. What If this works and if I can click into it, it's like a four-page document, but I want to highlight the important parts and like why I did the things that I did. 
And as I'm clicking into this, I want to make the note that if I didn't know and trust my students to a certain point, I would not have tried this. And so if I was teaching a like 50 to 100 person or more class, like this would absolutely not have happened. And I realized folks in this room were probably at very different places. So uh, let's see if this works. Okay. So um, we have some context and framing right here. And here's where it gets interesting. So suppose that one of your well-intentioned colleagues asks a chat bot to basically like do this midterm for you. And so they input this prompt and then their output is here. And so actually DJ, we can click into the output. It's we're gonna double link. Here? Yeah, it says chat GPT statistics summary. It's an essay, I called it implementation report, but it's the same thing. Um, and so I have four pages here of chat GPT's writing of what it would have submitted. And I talked about this with my center director before I gave this to him because I thought it was important to get his input. But we, we talked about like this is both good and terrible at the same time. And we spent some time diving into like what makes it good and what makes it terrible. The things that made it good were that it actually was pretty coherent, it flowed, it transitioned well between sections. It was very organized. I didn't tell it to like make these number sections with these headings, but it did that quite clearly. And if students are able to see that and think like, oh, that's a nice way to organize writing, like Sure, why not? I do that for conference papers, and so if it works for them, it works for them. But if you actually dig into the substance, even though there's citations, which are like kind of misleading, um, it's actually not really saying much about education at all, like what it would look like on the ground in a classroom. It also doesn't say how different topics in statistics would be taught differently, either with different tools or different pedagogies, how different learner challenges that we know from the literature impact different topics in different ways. And so I would absolutely expect a student who has been in my class to know that and to add like that nuance into what they submitted. So basically, what this document does is it gives them an example of like what does bad or low quality look like. And then on the rubric that I gave them, which if we go back into the first um, Google Doc, sorry, these are nested and they probably shouldn't be. But um, I show them that oh. the criteria, yeah, yeah, scroll down, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Last page. Okay, there it is. Substantive writing. A little bit more. Perfect. Thank you, DJ. Um, I tell them that I'm grading them on these dimensions right here. And these were, um, aside from the last one, um, came out of that conversation with my center director and I, where we basically said, okay, what are things that AI is not good at? And that's what we're going to grade you on in your writing. So I'm very much looking to see how they do that. Um, one last thing that I did in this midterm that I think is important to mention, and then we can wrap my portion up. If you scroll back up one page, um, uh, back down one page. Okay, perfect, stop. Um, one thing I did was I, I told students directly how I use Gen AI in my own writing. So even when I'm writing like a conference paper or like a journal article, sometimes I really struggle with transitioning um, and wrapping up a paragraph mm -hmm. and I'll give myself like I'm gonna struggle for like five minutes and then I'm gonna ask the AI for a suggestion and then probably what will happen is I'll take the AI's suggestion for a concluding transitional sentence I'll see what's wrong with it and I'll fix it but then I'll be able to get myself unstuck quicker than if I would have just sat there and puzzled about it for like the next half hour in my writing group and so by telling them here's how I do it it helped I think it gives them like sort of permission to use it in ways that you know, improve the quality of their writing. What I did do in <clears throat> bullet point 16 was I said, do not use Gen AI in the following ways, if you could scroll down just a little bit. And what I said was, I have five writing samples from you this quarter, because um, I do, because of the assignments they turned in. I generally know what you look, uh, what you write like. I also generally know what AI sounds like. And so you should sound like yourself. Um, in addition to being detailed and precise and all of those other things that I mentioned. Um, yeah, so I wanted to share that this could be 
just like, like I said, this is due on Sunday. This could end up terrible. Um, everyone could have cheated, and then we'd be <laughs> back at square, like zero or negative one, because then I'd, I'd feel bad. Um, but I thought it was important to try, and I thought this was a good avenue to try it, and so I'm excited to see um, what opportunities and challenges this surfaces. Um, but the TLDR is I think we need more specific disciplinary ways to think about AI use and really build that sense of like, you know, does it fulfill a need and does it not? And I, I screenshotted this part of uh, the presentation earlier because if AI really is becoming an essential part of professions, I think it's up to us as educators to define what that essence actually is rather than companies and corporations defining that for us. Uh, yeah. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Victoria. And I neglected to say when Victoria came up, Dr. Delaney is an assistant professor of data science and statistics education in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, and she's an affiliate faculty member with CRIMSI, SDSU's Center for Research in Math and Science Education. And it's pronounced CRIMSI when I first got here, I was calling it crimes. Uh, and that's, that's not what it's all about at all. So. <laughs> Let's take five. I would love for you to talk with the people you're sitting near. What is one assignment in one of your classes that in which you're using Gen AI, whether in large or in mini? Or what's an assignment that could include a generative AI element? Or, or what's an assignment you could really screw up? with the addition of generative AI. What I love about Victoria's example, when she was communicating with me uh, before today, she said, this could turn into a real dumpster fire. <laughs> and I respect that none of us really knows exactly what the outcomes are. I mean, if you're following generative AI at the largest scale, this could turn into a real dumpster fire. The guy who just got a Nobel Prize as the godfather of generative AI quit his job at Google so that he could have more freedom to tell the general public this could all turn into a dumpster fire. <laughs> so with that cheerful caveat, take a few minutes and talk with the people as you finish your dessert. What's an assignment you've already assigned to your students that invites them to use generative AI? Or maybe what's one that could? either with beneficial or destructive consequences. Take five. You know, I always hate interrupting a lively conversation. This is clearly the highlight of the class. <laughs> but I'd love to surface some of your responses. Who's, who's, got a, who's got a good response here that you'd like to share with the group? Susan? Well, actually, I didn't, but um, <laughs> David here did. <laughs> and so um, you, you do realize that um, they are actually improving the chat GPT in such a way that you can actually have a conversation with it, right? Yeah. So I, I think from her presentations that um, her students are just putting a single prompt into the chat GPT and then it gives them a response. Right. And then they just go with that response. You can actually have a conversation with ChatGPT. Oh, can you tweak this? Can you explain differently how this goes? But then again, you'd have to know exactly what you're doing to be able to do that. I was just telling her that last week we had a, an experiment in a, in a chemistry lab. I collected some data. They had to plot the graph and then hand draw their connected dots like a smooth curve and then uh, read off certain points from the graph so that you have to do it manually to be able to actually get those points. But I took the data I collected and just dumped it onto ChatGPT. It gave me exactly what I was expecting. Yeah. So my fear is that students who would know their way around AI may get full credit for an exercise, but they have no clue what right. they're doing. So in, in, at the end of the day, they're actually not learning anything. It's it can be really problematic. And it's absolutely fair to say that 
and this is sometimes frustrating to me if I uh, am having conversation with a colleague who is queasy about generative AI, the person might say, well, the first draft, the, you know, I asked to write a sonnet and it was terrible. Okay, well, that was the first five seconds. What if you gave it some feedback? Mm -hmm. Three drafts later, it's going to be really much better. Uh, so I think that the kind of iterative interaction that David's describing can lead to a better result, whether you're brainstorming with it or trying to get it to do its own wordsmithing. Who else is using generative AI? Hatun. Well, I did sort of that kind of an exercise in class, actually, because I yeah. was hearing a lot about um, um, speech pathologists working in schools with large caseloads. They're using AI to create treatment goals because they are short on time and they're not really thinking through. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we we did it in class. So we pulled up, I pulled up ChatGPT. I um, said, you know, he, briefly, like, here's this case, come up with treatment goals for him. Well, the first goals that AI came up with were extremely ableist and against everything that I mm -hmm. preached. Wow. And then we gave feedback. We said, oh, these are, they are problematic. Here is why. Yeah. And then it said, oh, I apologize. Here are update, updated goals. Mm -hmm. Those were better. And then we gave a little bit more feedback. And after a couple of back and forth, the goals were actually OK. You know, mm -hmm. they, were, they could be usable. But yeah. you know, it requires that meta, uh, wait, you know, uh, that that kind of skill level. It requires metacognitive thinking. It requires a perspective on an entire discourse or discipline, mm -hmm. and it requires your own critical thinking skills mm -hmm. to be able to identify what's not here and what could be. In other words, students who are uh, outsourcing their thinking entirely to generative AI at, say, 18 to 22, mm -hmm. are going to be missing the opportunity to get the kind of knowledge that would make them much more sophisticated users mm -hmm. of these potentially powerful tools. Yeah. Yes? So I guess I had a follow-up question because that was my reservation with using AI. I have, my reservation is I don't feel like my students are prepared for that. Like, I don't feel like they have the critical thinking skills that are required to be able to learn how even begin to learn how to use AI properly. Like they just want they just kind of use this as a crutch as a tool to like mm -hmm. as a shortcut. That's kind of how they're seeing it. Mm -hmm. But like I guess the question is one, how do you gauge whether your students are indeed ready for this type of uh, implementation with AI? Yeah. Like yeah. do they have the proper critical things because I don't think my students do right. all, all right. students. <laughs> um, and then the other question is like then how do you make that switch? How do you encourage that kind of thinking? I guess this is more less of an AI question rather than how do you teach critical thinking type of question. Whew. How do you teach critical thinking in the age of generative AI? How do you teach critical thinking with generative AI? Can you teach critical thinking with generative AI. You know, uh, in the Bowen and Watson book, Teaching with AI, one of the examples they give of course policy, which is the Bowen and Watson term for like an uh, AI syllabus statement, they offer uh, a course that would have three writing assignments. Take this and reinvent it for your own discipline. And one of them, and they each, each assignment has a different expectation for the use of generative AI. And the first assignment is res completely restricted. You may not use generative AI tools here. I want you to cultivate your own writing skills so that you can become better writers, better readers, better editors, better evaluators. And then the next was more like uh, the assignment that Marwa had here, where you can develop the idea on your own. Here are the parameters for what you do with your own little organic brain. And then here's where you could use generative AI. And then a third assignment in which uh, things are a bit less restricted, but documentation should be used. If there's a paragraph that you develop where you write in collaboration with generative AI, you should cite that uh, along with your other sources. So this person, the Bowen and Watson book is suggesting, here's a course that takes a kind of critical intellectual development over 15 weeks. Now whether that's realistic to take your students from developing their own individual writing skills to uh, using a kind of AI literacy to 
to really mastering in, in 15 weeks AI literacy to the point where they are using it effectively and responsibly by the end of the semester. That's the aspiration for a course designed like that. Your question is still sound. Can, can we really do that? Can we expect that? Uh, David. You could, you could also use AI. They could also use AI as a learning tool. Um, I was, uh, my, my daughter had a, a math um, assignment the other day. I was able to log into, I've forgotten the, um, the, the, the app, but you could fill in a math problem, for example, and then you submit it. It shows you the step of how you move from point A to point B to point C and how you finally get the answer. But it doesn't only spit that at you. It asks you a question the next time. So if it's 2x plus 3 equals 0, and then it's going to ask you, what do you think x is going to be? If you can't respond, you click continue, and then it shows you how to get x equals 3 and stuff like that. But um, <coughs> you, can, you can actually use that to actually teach yourself, or the student can actually use that. I don't think we can stop students from using it. Right. They're going to use it. I was telling her that my third grade key was telling me that uh, uh, they've introduced chat GPT, she needs an account. <laughs> so if they are using it at the elementary school right now, imagine what they'll be when they get to university. So I, I don't think teachers have any choice. We have to learn it, whether we like it or not. There's no points like sitting on the fence. You're sitting on the fence, you're, 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 you're probably on the other side. And this is where we have the opportunity to not only, as Victoria was saying, teach the effective use of this, which could be iterative development, but also I think it's important to teach the ethical use of this, especially if, when we're teaching teachers to say, hey, maybe third grade or, or three-year-olds, maybe these are the opportunities to teach the basic skills that they need long before they come into contact with these more powerful tools that can be efficiencies, but perhaps not uh, where we want to have foundational thinking happening. Now, we're short on time, so I do want to move briefly to like, what's coming up next, but I think, Susan, you had a hand? Oh, I was just thinking, I yeah. mean, it's comes, it's developing so quickly. So we're talking about what it spits out and what you can do with it now. Oh. But two years from now, it's going to be a completely different animal. So right. that, to me, is what's scary. Yes. Yes. The, all I can say is yes. It does feel like that. The last 22 months have moved very fast in this field and its impact has been significant. So the course on Canvas for this, uh, the module on Canvas for this week, uh, Generative AI and Instructional Technology Services, our, my, our colleague, Dr. Sean Howes, wasn't able to join us today. So we've shifted focus to AI literacy. And so there's this very easy reading, update your syllabus for chat GPT. It's actually from about a year ago. It's lasted pretty well. I find it evergreen, very short and easy to read. I've got a couple paragraph overview here that introduces the following materials. Briefly, an AI syllabus statement, a bit of a review. The four C's MLA AI literacy student handout that I showed you today. It's two pages. You can either click through a link in the overview or access the PDF here. I think it's quite useful regardless of your field. And I haven't talked about these guidelines for AI use. This is another easy reading three-page document developed by uh, members of the university, this university Senate's Instructional Technology Committee. And it provides some useful parameters that you might wish to incorporate into your own coursework, assignments, or syllabi. And the activity to complete this module is super simple. Uh, all you've got to do is navigate over to the micro-credential and enroll and screenshot. How many of you are already enrolled in the micro-credential? That's fantastic. So all you've got to do is navigate over to the micro-credential, <laughs> show that you've already got access, screenshot that, and you're done. Many faculty, more than a quarter of all SDSU faculty have enrolled. Far fewer have completed to the point where you get a micro-credential badge. Uh, 
But also quite a few have gone through and skimmed it and gotten the, the surface level information without the assignments. It's also possible to uh, avoid the rabbit holes that end each of the modules here. I was just talking with some of the writers. There's some videos and some external links that you actually don't have to do to get the micro-credential. If you go down every rabbit hole they offer you, it's going to be eight hours plus. You can do it in under eight hours for the badge if you want to decorate your email signature uh, in well under eight hours. Yes? Oh, I was going to ask how long does it take? If you avoid the rabbit holes, do you say under five hours to get the badge? It took me a little longer. It took me ten hours, but I probably went down every single rabbit hole <laughs> because I always have. Yeah. Yeah. Summer and there's like five modules. If you yeah. count the zero, welcome. Here's how it plays out. And yeah. So I just put it to myself like, let me do one module a week. Uh huh. I have it in me to do that, okay. and I did one module, and I'm like. That was quicker than I thought it would be. Uh -huh. So it was like Good. a doable goal. I think okay. I got it done in five. It was like less than an hour for each one. But again, it tells you, if you're interested in more, just don't go <laughs> Right. Unless right. there's something that's like calling to you. Right. It's like, Taylor, this is what you want. <laughs> right. And speaking of unhelpful rabbit holes, uh, I'm actually participating in an unhelpful rabbit hole. Uh, on October 23rd, I'm joining this Alchemy webinar. And it's hosted by Brett Christie, who's one of the academic leaders for this company. But it's about AI literacy and trying to encourage more faculty to engage. I tend to make a distinction between adoption and adaptation. I don't necessarily feel that every faculty member needs to adopt these tools for every course or every assignment. I do feel, though, that we need to adapt for the changing landscape of higher education in this new era of generative AI. So that's part of what I'm going to be talking about in this webinar in a couple of weeks. Any last questions? Sounds as doing as climate change. <laughs> Everyone needs to adapt. But yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Choose your dumpster fire. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.